welcome to St. Andrews. So good to be with you today. My name is Jason, and if I haven't met you yet, I would love to. Uh, after the service, either out there or over at Starting Point, would love to get to know you for a second. But before I give you all the warm fuzzies, we're going to talk about something that's not fun today. It's the dreaded W word, waiting. In 1955, uh, my favorite kitchen appliance was introduced into the world, the microwave. It's the only one that I've mastered, but it held the promise of no longer waiting. And, and ever since then, we've been frustrated by the fact, does anyone, by the way, does anyone use any other button besides just that add 30 seconds button? <laughs> like that's the only one they needed. It could have been on, off and that, that'd be it. Um, I was thinking about, as we get ready to talk about waiting and how to build our faith through a waiting period, I was thinking about just how paradoxical our world is right now. Simultaneously, we have to wait less often. There's so many conveniences, so many things that technology has done that allows us to not have to wait, and yet every moment spent in waiting feels longer than ever, doesn't it? It's kind of weird. Um, and, and just, it's a blessing that God has done. The other day, uh, we had a crisis in our house. There's a little plastic container that holds the dog food. Uh, was just about out. And we realized that our dog was not going to make it through another couple days unless we got food for it. Now, she's like four pounds. She eats seven pellets at a time. And we had like 15 left, so don't, don't freak out and call SPCA or anything on me. But, but we realized we got to do something. And so I'm like, all right, time to go get some dog food. So I get ready to go to the, to the store. And Jessica's like, just order it. Just Amazon it. Amazon Prime. It'll be here tonight. I was like, that really is amazing, isn't it? That we can just, on our phone, dog food, or whatever else you see that you really want, you just hit buy now, and somebody will drop it off to your front door this evening, usually. And when they don't, when you got to wait till tomorrow, I mean, we lose our minds. And I, it's just so interesting to me how poor we are at waiting, and yet how much of life is waiting. How many of you would say that you've been in a season of waiting on something recently, waiting on God to answer a prayer, something to happen in your life? Anybody? Been wait Look at that. Look around at your friends. We're, we're all, we're waiting. And when we're waiting on a really good thing, especially every moment just seems perilously long. There's a way, though, for us to wait that will grow and strengthen our faith. We're in the series, we're talking about how to build faith, how to walk by faith, actually. And we've been using this definition that the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 uses, and it says this, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't yet see. So think about that. That, in, that means waiting. You, you, you have confidence in something that you don't have right now, but you're hoping for it, and you're sure of the outcome of it. And so we've been looking at different characters in Hebrews chapter 11 that would remind us uh, or even instruct us on how to wait well, how to grow in our faith, how to be more confident in who God is and assured of the outcome. And so today we're going to look at a character named Hannah. Uh, now, she's actually not in Hebrews 11. I just cheated because I like her. Uh, but, but truthfully, her son is. If you go through reading Hebrews 11, it'll mention somebody named Samuel, and that is Hannah's son. Samuel was one of the prophets of Israel and just a great, great leader. Uh, but I thought we'd just, you know, jump from him to the one that's really behind who he is and what grew his faith. And that's his mother. It's a powerful story of what waiting looks like. And so if you're in a season of waiting, especially a painful one, I just pray that right now God, through his word, uh, would speak right to your heart about what to do as you wait. Hannah has this great prayer uh, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to start there, and I want you to hear these words. She prays out loud and says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. The horn is just like this strength, like the horn of an animal would be where the strength is. Her strength is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your delivery. There is no one holy like the Lord. There's no one besides you. There's no rock like our God. That just sounds like a woman in triumph, right? She's gotten the thing that she waited for. That's, that's part of the context. When she writes this prayer, she is saying, God, I am so grateful. You are the only one that matters. You're the only one worth worshiping. You are where my confidence is placed. And it's just really beautiful. But 
if you knew all that went into those words, the story that's behind, and in fact, the secret that we're going to find in how she got to this place, you'll never view this passage the same. So I want to tell you that story and have us walk through it. It's going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And it goes like this. There's a man named Elkanah. Uh, he lived around 11th century BC in a part of the ancient Near East called Ephraim. It was part of where the tribes of Israel had settled. Elkanah was a good and godly guy. He was a, a worshiper of Yahweh. Um, but he wasn't the best at family dynamics. You'll see in just a moment. Verse 2, it says, Elkanah had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Now, there's a lot in those two verses. Elkanah had married Hannah, and because she wasn't able to have children, he had to take another wife on. Uh, and, and that wife was able to have kids. In our world, not being able to have children is a tough thing. We, we all feel the empathy for that. Many of you have walked through that experience. Or you've been touched by it in some way. Infertility is so difficult. It feels so lonely. It feels like such a long wait. Uh, and yet, in, as, as difficult as it is for us, it was even more troubling in this time. And, and here's why. Because if you were childless in that period, that meant that your actual life was in danger. You, you didn't have kids to work the family business. There probably wasn't enough financial means because of that to be able to buy food and shelter and clothing, all the things that we need. So being childless was a really rough thing then. Even more so, being childless uh, usually caused people to look at you like there was something wrong with you. There was a cultural expectation that you would just have kids. So much so that if you didn't in that day, people would assume that you had done something wrong that God was punishing you, or that you were cursed in some way. So there was this cultural pressure to have children. Now, we know all about cultural pressure, right? Uh, for us, it may be a little bit different. There, it seems like there's still the expectation for children, but we have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, have a certain amount of money. Do, we feel a lot of that, right? And it's easy to slip into the, if I don't have that, then I don't measure up. I'm, I'm nothing. For Hannah, she was living under the pressure of society's side eye, always looking at her like she wasn't enough. And it gets worse. Elkanah would take them all up, the family, to a place called Shiloh, where the tabernacle was. And they would go to worship once a year. And every time he would go, it says, uh, he would give portions of the meat for the meal they would share a meal together and then offer some of that meat to be burned. He would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, Peninnah, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah would go up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and she couldn't even eat. And her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, baby, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Um, let's pause right there for a moment. Is that not the most stereotypical, clueless, insensitive male that you've ever heard? <laughs> Honey, I, I know you don't have the thing your heart desires the most in the world, but you got all this. <laughs> this is yours. Not to mention, you can order double meat at the in and out Double meat. That's the way we do it, right? Animal style, if they had it. Like, this is, you got it all, baby. I got you. Why, what would you possibly want more of? I mean, he's just, like, again, he's, he's holy. He's just not bright. But imagine what that's like for Hannah, though. See, this is where Elkanah, you read between the lines, and he actually messes up a little bit because he thinks he's showing love to the one that he feels bad for, the empathy, but he's creating this dynamic in the home that's really, really toxic because now Penina, who has the kids and has done the thing that he wanted, she starts getting mad because like, wait a second, I delivered, and you love her more? 
She gets, so now she starts getting angry, and he's created this system that's never going to work out well. In fact, anytime you see in the scripture some semblance or some example of polygamy, it never works out well. God is never at all trying to say this is the way to do it. But here's another example. So every day they sit down at the table and they have a meal, and, and Hannah's just reminded of what she doesn't have. In fact, think about it. It says that they're at worship. So you might could imagine, in a hypothetical world, someone coming into this room, gathered with the community of faith, singing songs about how beautiful and good God is, and only being able to focus on the thing that they don't have yet. You, you could imagine that world, right? Some of us have lived that world. Not to poke too hard, but some of us, that's the story for today. Like you came in here and like you'll say this stuff, yeah, yeah, God, you're really good, but I'm still waiting on this. And we, we put all of our hope and trust in the this thing that we lack. In fact, it's one of the difficulties about this story. It's because we all understand it. Everybody has what Hannah has. We can relate. We all have a place of barrenness, a place of lack, Something that you think, and I think, if I just had that, and then you fill in the blank, right? We, we, we all know what that feels like. And we've also all got a panina, something or someone that reminds us often of what we don't have. For some of you, it's the brother-in-law. Every time you go to the family gathering, and he's got the boat, and he's got the, and you're just reminded of what you don't have yet. Some, for some of you, it's you're waiting desperately for a spouse, and, and that's what you want, and your friends have gotten married, and you've been bridesmaid, and waiting is just, you're just done. Maybe it's actually a child, like, like Hannah, or something else in our life. And here's the difficulty. It's really easy for us in a seer, uh, season of waiting to just focus down on I want, I want, I want, I want, I need, I need, I have to have, I have to have, and it can become our identity. That's really dangerous. When you build your identity based on the thing you don't yet have, you know people like this. It's like every time you talk to them, all they can talk about is what they're still waiting on. I'm still waiting on the man. I'm still waiting on the girl. I'm still waiting on the job. I'm still waiting, whatever. And that becomes who they are. There's a serious danger in this comparison trap. Because when you compare to people, you always end up with, with one of two options. Comparison is horrible. When you look around, as Hannah's doing, sitting in worship, looking around at all the people and what she doesn't have, thinking about that, you either feel inferior, right, or you feel prideful because you have something that someone else doesn't have. That, that's our only options. And so making our identity out of the thing that we don't have or the thing that we want desperately leads us to what might be called idol worship, really. Because an idol is just a good thing that we make ultimate. It's, it's the thing that we begin to believe, if I just have that, I'll be complete. Or if I lose that, I'm finished. An, an idol are good things that we put on top. And the only thing that can satisfy, the only thing that can carry the weight of expectation of completing us, sorry, Jerry Maguire was wrong. No one completes you. God alone can do that. And part of our issue is we put that pressure on a spouse. Like, you finally get married, and it's like, fantastic. I can train him and shape him, and I will make him exactly the right, and it's going to complete. But you know that's not true. It doesn't work like that. Your kids, your job, your spouse, it can't handle the weight of being an idol. But it seems like that's what's happened with Hannah. And then we watch everything change for her. This is, this is so beautiful. I don't know how long she had to wait on this. I don't know how many years she had to spend being reminded of what she couldn't do yet, of where her lack was. But at some point, Scripture says she stands up after a meal, and she leaves and goes to the, where the tabernacle is, and she goes to worship before God. And she's praying with just complete honesty, just laying her heart out. It says she's weeping bitterly and in deep anguish, but it's an action step. And it says this in verse 11, that she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you'll only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget her, 
but give her a son. God, if you'll just, if you'll, I've been waiting so long. If you'll do this, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. That is incredible. God, I want this thing so much and I believe it's from you. And I, it will do, I'll do the unthinkable. If you give it to me, I'll turn around and give it back. I will steward or surrender it back to you. That takes a lot of faith. In fact, there's two seasons in life that require faith. Big faith. The first is waiting for God to answer. It's, and it takes a ton when you don't know when it's going to come and you have to stay. But in the waiting phase, we don't have control over it. Right? So you, you're just passively having to, to sit there, it seems. But then it requires faith when God answers for you to turn around and surrender, or at least maybe we call steward it for God. When he gives you the job, he answers with the paycheck, he gives you the spouse, now you have to steward that thing for his kingdom and glory rather than just grasp and control. That probably requires more faith than waiting. And she demonstrates this. Vowing to give her son back in the service of God. Hannah pre-decides what she's going to do when God answers, and that's going to be a key as we move forward. Well, Eli, the priest, he thinks that she's drunk. She's weeping so loudly. She's in anguish, and her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out, it says, that he, and, and this should just, it's a little clue of kind of how messed up Eli is. You can read more about him on your own, but... Um, he says, would you put the bottle down and quit drinking in the house of God? What is wrong with you? And she says, not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I haven't been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and my grief. And something changes in Eli. It's almost as if in a moment he sees her the way that God sees her. And he says, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. He softens. And she says, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And listen to this. Then she went her way, and she ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. There was a visible, physical change when she realized God is listening to me. When she took action, she went and laid out her request before God openly and honestly, and she realizes God heard. And she changes. That is that's pretty amazing. And it says early the next morning, her and, and Elkanah and the family, they arose and they worshiped before the Lord. And then they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Beautiful story. So redemptive. The, the woman who was known for her lack and who believed that her identity was in what she didn't have and how she couldn't live up to the expectation suddenly gets the thing that she's been waiting for. That is wonderful. Make a Hallmark movie out of it. We'll watch it on repeat around Christmas, right? It's just, it's great. But how do we, what do we get from that? How do we start to learn to act in faith when we're waiting? What, there are three things that I think she does that I want to show you real quick that you can put into practice right where you are in your season of waiting, how to wait with faith. And it's so important that we learn this because you know them and I know them, maybe you've been them. People have literally lost their faith, deconstructed their faith because God didn't answer a prayer at the time or in the way that they wanted. You've seen that, right? And sometimes we get it, it's a long wait. And it seems like God is just not interested. And we've got to learn how to spend those seasons of waiting, building our faith, not eroding our faith. You know, it's uh, two kinds of, of wait, wait rooms. Um, one of them is really annoying. It's the one that you go to when you're, you know, to the doctor and you're like, you got your appointment, it's 10.15, you show up at 10.12, but they're nowhere close to being ready for you. And you sit in the wait room and that, you know what that furniture looks like. It's always the same, Right? And you pick up the 25-year-old magazine, and there's nothing you can do but just sit and passively wait. And you don't know how, it's interminably long. You have no idea what it's going to take. You can wait like that. 
There's another kind of weight room, the W-E-I-G-H-T. I went to public school, but I think I'm, that was right. Spelling, the weight room. The weight room where we choose to enter and engage with resistance so that we can grow stronger. Uh, yesterday morning, Jessica and I uh, got up. I'd say we got up. She drug me, um, like dragged, that kind of, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to a boot camp workout. And wow, was that special. <laughs> um, we chose to get up at 6 in the morning and show up to a place where this little guy that I guarantee you I could have squashed if I wanted, but he yelled at me for an hour to do things with my body that it shouldn't do. It just, you, you know what, right? You, you've been in that kind of weight room. Why do we choose that? And what good, because I walked out of that, if you want to know what waiting feels like too, man, two minutes in a plank, that feels like forever, does it not? Con, uh, compared to like whenever you're two minutes late for work, how fast that two minutes goes. But the two minutes holding that position is, is just unbelievable. And I feel like I should have an eight pack by the time I was done with this, you know, hour. I, sh I feel it. Something's happening in me, but you can't see it yet. The same is true when we choose to enter the weight room with faith and say, God, I'm going to trust that you're doing something in me as I wait. That the ultimate goal is not just to get the thing that I want, but I'm going to learn how to wait well. C.S. Lewis has this great quote in Mere Christianity. He says, I don't know why. Um, there's this difference, but I am sure that God keeps no one waiting unless he sees that it's good for him or her to wait. I don't like C.S. Lewis. <laughs> I think he's right, but I sure don't like that quote. But he's absolutely onto something. God is not withholding good from us while we wait. God is withholding and causing us to wait so that he can do something good in us. Because God's purpose in our waiting is always to make us into something more. He is a really good father who loves his kids desperately, who sees what we want and what we need and will give all of those things, but he does it in the right way and at the right time. And sometimes that means we have to wait. And so you and I get to choose. Are we going to collaborate with God in that? Are we going to participate with him in the waiting period? Or are we going to fight against him and just struggle the whole time? How we choose to do this makes all of the difference because God has purpose in the wait. And, and we see that sometimes when we have to surrender, like give up or, or, or just choose to say whatever your will, we see that he was actually up to something bigger. I mean, the best example of that is Jesus in the garden, right? He's there praying, sweating, like, kind of like Hannah, just anxious and pouring out his heart so much to the Father saying, I don't want this to be what happens next. Is there any other way we can do this? Is it possible for us to save them, to bring them back without me having to go through this pain, this sheer hell that I'm about to face? And the Father says, no, this is it. And Jesus, we're told, surrendered at that moment. And that his face then was set like flint toward Jerusalem where he would go to die and he didn't waver again. That, that moment of deciding, God, okay, I surrender to your will in my way, that is what makes us strong. And it's also what brings out of an impossible situation something, something that's beautiful. So three quick ways that we see with Hannah on how to wait well, how to wait actively. Uh, the first, if you notice, um, it says that they got up the next morning after El, uh, Eli told her, you know, may the Lord grant you what you're asking for. They got up and worshiped and then they went home. Notice that she chooses to worship before God answers her prayer. She chooses to worship God for who he is, not for what he's done for her. And this is key. Worship is our first tool. And I know that sounds like uh, yawn, ho-hum, we're in church, of course he's going to say worship. But really, worshiping God in that way, if you're in a season of waiting, you come to this place or you go to your room or your car, or however it is that you engage God with worship, and you focus your mind on who he is, not just on the thing that he can do for you. 
and you recount and you sing and you pray and you remember and you recall and you testify to his goodness in the past and his faithfulness. Set your mind actively on who God is, not just the thing that he can do. That's, that's the first key. It's a powerful weapon. Second is the prayer, but a certain kind of prayer. Hannah is so super honest with God. I mean, so much so. Can you imagine praying so desperately with God that somebody near you thought maybe you had had a couple too many early in the morning? That's how raw she is. And here's the thing that I know to be true about many of us. When we are in that long season of waiting, especially when we start to see hope erode, like you may say you're still holding on, but there's a part of you uh, that's given up. And you start to pray really safe prayers. God, if it's, if it's your will, maybe, I don't think you actually will, but if you, if you choose to, right? Or, or we get it real, like, stay on the surface. We don't want God to know how badly we want this and like we're going to jinx it, you know? God, I really, really would love to be married, but if you choose to do something different, that's okay. Thank you. Amen. You know, hang up. Man, if you've gotten to that place where you're praying prayers that don't have that level of faith of like, God, I have got to desperately hold on to you until you do this thing, it's time today to start again. Look at this woman who chose to go after God with ultimate raw honesty and look at the way he responds back to her. I'm not saying that it's going to happen in the next moment. I don't know how and when God will answer, but I do know that we have over and over examples in the scripture of where God honors that kind of prayer from the persistent widow to the unjust judge to the neighbor at night. There are all kinds of ways where God says he just loves for us to come at him with everything we have. Just bring it. He can handle it. He's a big boy, I promise. But you pray like that. And then finally, you predecide what you're going to do with his gift, with his answer. Determine now before you have it how you're going to steward for his kingdom. Whenever you get the job, you decide now. If that means I'm going to give, you know, I've been out of a job for, for three months, for two years, for what feels like forever, and I feel all this lack and all the place where I'm, but I'm going to choose God to give to you out of the money that you provide for me before I even get the first paycheck. I'm going to choose to let my marriage be not just about fulfilling my needs, but about us accomplishing something big for your kingdom. I'm going to choose not to dr- just destroy my kids with my expectations over them so that they look great compared to the other families. I'm going to choose to help train them up in the way they should go so that they become a trophy of your grace. I'm going to choose now before I have them. You pre-decide how to steward his gift. And when we do that, God will use our season of waiting, the wait room, to build faith rather than leak faith. You will find that you'll become stronger. You'll be able to wait longer and, and your belief and your hope will begin to rise because you've begun to participate with God in the waiting room, not struggle against him. John Ortberg says that biblically waiting is not something that we have to do until we get what we want. Biblically, waiting is part of the process of becoming what God wants us to be. And that who you become while you're waiting is equally as important as what you're waiting for. Do you believe that? Could you believe that? Maybe right now you don't, I get it, it's hard. But is it possible that you might choose to say, God, I'm gonna trust that what you're doing in me right now as I actively wait for this thing is more important and more powerful than getting the thing that I want. Could you trust him that way? Hannah goes home, and after about two or three years, it says when the child is weaned, she grabs little Samuel by the hand, and she walks him back to Eli. And she fulfills the vow and drops off the boy. She has predecided that she's going to steward God's gift 
for his purpose. And so she follows through. And I was thinking about how all those years, maybe two, three years, whatever, what that was like for her, where at the kitchen table, when they would gather around and eat, instead of uh, the years where there was like her by herself, now she is sitting there with little Samuel on her knee and she's feeding him and it's all over his face and her and and you know how that happens with, with kids. And she's looking at Penina, who made fun of her for all those years. And she's like, what do you got now? I got the boy, I got Elkanah's love, and I got double meat. (laughs) And then what faith and courage to one day pack up his little stuff and walk him to the temple. To take the thing that now she would be tempted to make her identity about and go give him back to God. That is the kind of faith that I want. Thank God for women of faith that show us the way. And she goes through with it and it says this, I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him, so now I give him to the Lord and his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped him there. It says that every year after that, Hannah would go up to the temple and, and I love this about the Bible. It says that she would bring him a little robe just to remind us of how small he was and how real that was. She brought a little robe and she'd see Samuel and she could have never known in the moment where she predecided, God, I'll use this for your glory. She could have never known who Samuel would become, that we are talking about her today because of that decision. Because that little boy became one of the great prophets who anointed the first king of Israel. And all of that because this woman whose life looked like it was barren forever learned how to wait in strength and build her faith. That is what we need, is it not? Man, can you imagine what might happen here? If in all those seasons that you and I have right now where we're waiting, if you came out of them stronger and the next thing that came and the next thing you prayed for and the next time you were with somebody that was struggling through that season, you were able to say, wait, I got a story to tell you. Imagine what might happen if our faith grew that way. So here's the big idea of the message. It's that it takes faith to get stronger in the weight room, not weaker. And I want to ask you to make a decision today to choose to to exercise in the weight room, to build faith in that place. Doesn't matter how you got or where you are right now, but starting here, would you choose to participate with God in that, worship him for who he is, pray with reckless abandon and honesty, and pre-decide how to use what he gives, and we'll see what God does with it in us. So I thought a way to start it might be this, and the band can go ahead and and come on up, but Hannah, that prayer that she prayed at the beginning that we read, I thought, what if we made that our prayer today? What if we just said those words back to God? So I want you to put in your mind um, the thing that you're waiting on, the thing that you really, really need, and that you just want God to come through on. Grandkid who's a prodigal, financial issue, healing, whatever it is. Put it in your mind. I want you to imagine yourself on the other side of God answering that prayer. I want you to imagine what it's going to be like when you get to thank God and bless God for who he is, not just what he's given, and choose today to live with that kind of faith you'll have then. So let's read this together. Out loud, it says, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Heavenly Father, I pray now that in this room, in all the various situations and examples of waiting that are, that are collected here, God, I pray that you would come now in power and you would build our faith as we choose to trust you with it, with the season, not just with the outcome. 
I pray that you would give us the strength to participate in that way. God, would you make us, St. Andrews, a worshiping community that when people come in and see the way we worship you, God, for who you are, not just for what you've done, that it would be so attractive and so compelling and so gravitational because it's unlike anything else. The worship of your people for you and not just for the good things that you give us. God, I pray that you would make us aware of those places that we're tempted uh, to make idols, to make something that's good into something that's ultimate. Would you let us, with open hands, release those attachments? And I pray, God, that you would empower, move in those situations, and that you would bring the prodigals home, and that you would heal. God, that you would show yourself faithful as provider where that's needed, that you would begin to knit back the hearts of marriages that have begun to be frayed at the edges and that have come apart, and you would begin to renew in this place our faith and trust in you. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you that whenever you had the chance, you chose to surrender to the will of the Father rather than to hold on to control. And because of that, we have life. We love you, and we pray this in your beautiful name. Amen.